This is going to be a short video just about normalization. Uh, this is from Griffith's Introduction to Quantum Mechanics. Probably the textbook that you have if you're taking an undergraduate quantum mechanics class or if you're just interested in quantum mechanics in general, this is going to be the place to start. So we are back in chapter one, section 1 section 1.4, and this is about normalization. So normalization just means that if I have some particle and that particle is going to be described by this wave function, psi, then I have to have a probability of finding that particle. And the easiest way to think about that is if the particle exists, it's a real particle, it exists in space, then if I look at the probability density of finding the particle over all space, so from negative infinity to positive infinity, then that means that my probability of finding it somewhere, anywhere in the entire universe has to be 100%. We use this equation 1.20 in order to normalize a wave function. So our wave function can be pretty much anything, but we have to start applying conditions to it. And one of those conditions is that we have to be able to find a physical particle somewhere in space. So the integral of the probability density function over all space has to equal 100%. So it has to equal 1. And that means that whenever we have like some psi, we're basically going to have psi is going to equal some constant in front of whatever that function may be. So maybe it's something like an exponential function. We have this constant out in front because that doesn't affect the um, slope of it. Um, so when we take the derivative of it, um, we will just have the constant stay out in front. And then it allows us to apply this condition, which is called normalizing it. So we are normalizing our probability density function to equal 100% if we integrate over all space. So we do not allow for wave functions that are non-normalizable. So when we're looking for wave functions that are solutions to our problems, we have to have wave functions that um, this, this condition can be applied to. Now, you may wonder, well, what, why can't, or how do I consider the wave function changing over time? So what if I have a probability over some time that's different from another time? What if my psi is evolving over time? And that's something we'll look into in problem uh, 1.10. That will be a different video. So for now, we're going to look at the idea that if we normalize a wave function at time equals 0, so at the beginning, then we're going to say that it stays normalized even as the wave function evolves with time. And that's because if we keep, if we consider the wave function, um, the normalization of the wave function changing with time, then we have to keep renormalizing the wave function for every t, and there are infinite numbers of t, so we may no longer have solutions to our Schrodinger equation for all time. So we do have a property of the equation that allows us to make this condition that if I normalize at time t equals 0, then it's going to stay normalized. 
And I'm just going to walk you through this math that he does in Griffiths here, and we'll just explain all of this. And I am going to be explaining it sort of on the assumption that you may not be familiar with what all of these symbols are. First off, we have this here. This means change in time. So this is the derivative with respect to time. So if I have something on a graph as a function of t, we could just do x, say, then the derivative dx dt is the slope. So this is saying the slope with respect to t, or how t changes, how our function changes over t. Now we have the integral, and that's just fancy adding. That's taking it from negative infinity to positive infinity, so that's over all space. So our integral is literally the opposite of the derivative. So the area under the curve is the integral. This is also called antiderivative because they are opposites of each other. This is our wave function, the absolute value of our wave function squared. That is our probability density. Our wave function can be complex, meaning that it can have an imaginary number. So when we integrate it, we need to have our wave function times its complex conjugate so that we get a real function out. That's our probability density. And then we are integrating with respect to x. So we take the derivative with respect to t of the integral of the probability density function with respect to x. That is going to equal, it's just another way to rewrite it, I can take this d dt and I can write it as a partial derivative inside of the integral. And there's our same probability density function. Now, the next step going from 1.21 1 to 1 1.22 is that he's using the product rule to redefine this. So here you just drop the function of x and t notation just to make it more compact. So he's just writing out the product rule that if I have a derivative, partial derivative with respect to t of this guy, then that equals the partial derivative with respect to t of psi times complex conjugate psi, right here. And then he's just breaking that apart further using the product rule. So that's going to be wave function psi times the partial derivative of psi with respect to t plus the partial derivative with respect to t of complex conjugate psi, and then times the wave function psi. Now, a Schrodinger equation, this is what we did before. This is just it restated. Now, what he did here is just writing out the Schrodinger equation. If you have a complex conjugate of a number that has an imaginary part, so this guy has an imaginary part, meaning the complex conjugate has the opposite sign for the imaginary part. So positive, negative. And that's where this next step was taken. So if you write this all out, we have psi d psi dt plus d complex conjugate psi, dt psi. And then if we want to write that all out, then 
we end up getting psi complex conjugate times i h bar over 2m second derivative of psi with respect to x minus psi so I'm just writing out this guy complex conjugate psi i h bar v psi and then that will be plus now we're going to do this one and that's going to be minus h bar d psi 2m second derivative and now I have that positive sign and that's times psi and then I have that positive sign which means that these two terms with the potential V this term and this term are the same and they cancel out that's how he got this result here so he got that result because these potential terms now have a different sign and that was just a constant potential times the complex conjugate of the wave function constant potential times the wave function so our order of operation doesn't matter there they're just multiplied together so that's how those terms end up canceling out our first terms they do have opposite signs but we also have um, a different order of operation so we have psi complex conjugate this guy times that second derivative and then we have that second derivative of psi oh, I forgot to write complex conjugate there there we go times psi and then he just factored out this because those are just constants and then we can do another step where these are both second derivatives so you went ahead and factored out one derivative so it's just restating the change in time of the probability density and that's going to equal the partial derivative with respect to x of this whole thing now going back to the beginning back to this first part and we're writing out our ddt of the integral of the probability density function um, in some of the problems he also rewrite he also writes this as just uh, ddt of probability density function dx and that we just replace this guy with all the work we did up there with this so if we evaluate that integral we will just get what is inside here evaluated at those limits but we know that psi must go to zero as x goes to positive or negative infinity otherwise our wave function won't be normalizable so uh, we have to have a converging integral so I have to have something that you know whatever shape it's taking it's eventually going to go to zero as x goes to infinity same with negative infinity we have to be able to have a finite area under here so that if we take the area under that curve we can set it to be equal to one that is our condition for it to be normalizable in order for that condition to be true if I evaluate this integral at these points psi is going to zero at positive infinity makes that zero psi is going to zero at negative infinity that makes that zero too so that means that if we evaluate this result here we would get zero minus zero 
or we just get that the whole thing equals zero. And so what that tells us, what this equation is literally saying in English, is that the time derivative of our probability of finding the um, particle over all space is zero. Or the change in time of the probability of finding the particle at any point over all space is zero. So the time does not affect the probability of finding the particle at any point in all space because it does not depend on the change in time. This is constant with respect to time. So that means if I find the probability density or if I normalize my function with any time whatsoever, it is the same as any other time. I can find the probability I can integrate that probability density function over all space at time equals two seconds, and it will give me the same exact answer as if I um, did it at time equals 347 seconds. So since we can pick any number at all for the time, it makes sense to just do everything at time equals zero. And that's it for normalization. Uh, next videos, we're going to do these problems. So we have three problems that all have to do with normalization.